Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, let's first start off with what's in the news. So, uh, first of all, the country, or the world is actually now seeing a pretty significant increase in, in COVID cases. One and a half million cases last, uh, uh, last 28 days, an increase of 80%. So worldwide, we, we sort of expected this. It began in the late summer now, and we'll probably go through the fall. Uh, we've had a lot of cases reported, the highest number in Korea and the Pacific Rim. Uh, but I think what you can expect is uh, a continuing increase, uh, largely because of waning uh, immunity and, and, of course, the, the changing in the virus itself. That EG5 uh, variant is the fastest growing variant in, uh, in the Americas, in Europe, in the, and in the Western Pacific and it is now considered a variant of interest by the World Health Organization. Uh, so it seems to have a growth advantage. The only good news is it doesn't seem to have uh, any increase in virulence. Uh, but you look at an emerging uh, a variant that escapes immunity, a couple of mutations that allow it to escape immunity, immune response by the host, plus waning immunity, and the next thing you know, we have an increase in, in uh, COVID cases. Uh, in addition to that, uh, flu vaccines are coming out. Flu vaccinations will, uh, are going to be available shortly. Uh, and I will review them either this next week or the week after. But for people who, right now, the best time to get a flu vaccine is really in September, October, because the peak of flu season is, you know, it starts getting in December and January and February. So you don't want to get them too soon. Uh, but there are some people who probably should. So if you're in the third trimester of pregnancy, that's a good time to get it. Or if you're one of the children that need two doses, then getting your first dose now. But I'll review those vaccines shortly, and I'd, I'd sort of suggest that we all start thinking about getting them uh, mid-September in that, in that area. Uh, the COVID vaccines are also uh, going to be available in the fall. We expect that by the end of September. Uh, they are going to target the XBB variant. Um, Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax are all expected to have a revised uh, a, a shot available. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I agree yet with what they're planning. Right now it's planning on uh, targeting XBB 1.5 and as a single variant. I'll show you the data. My, I think it should be a bivalent variant, and I'm not even sure XBB 1.5 is the right one. But we'll talk about that as it, as it becomes available. The big difference is the government's no longer going to pay for it, uh, and they're going to try and make it uh, much more simplified in terms of eligibility. So I'll probably just say everybody uh, who, you know, get a COVID shot. Uh, now, one of our viewers asked uh, uh, about BioBot, which is really interesting. I said I'd look into it. So BioBot Analytics is the current vendor for the CDC wastewater testing contract. Uh, and they report uh, the data a little bit differently from the way uh, CDC reports it. They try to normalize it uh, for a fecal strength uh, uh, normalization factor, whereas the CDC uses uh, water flow and population. Uh, so they're not exactly apples to apples comparison, but they, they also include not only the CDC uh, data, but also other communities that they surveil, as well as uh, there's a group of communities that participate in a no cost network and they aggregate the data at a county level rather than on an individual wastewater level. So the CDC reports it differently, and it's by individual wastewater samples, uh, and they anonymize the treatment plant. So this is what BioBot Analytics shows. You can see the big peak in January 22 for the uh, wastewater vir uh, viral load, and you can begin to see this increase that we've all detected uh, in the last uh, month or so. This is the way the CDC reports it. It's different. This is by individual wastewater uh, sites. And if you look at it this way, 52% of the wastewater sites that are being sampled have shown a 100% or 200% increase in wastewater uh, um, amount of virus. So, you know, it's, it, they're slightly different, but they're both showing the same thing, which we're seeing a big increase in the amount of virus that's being eliminated in wastewater. Now, what I did was take those wastewater sites here on the right and compare it to this uh, 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 map, 
where brown indicates increase in hospitalizations. So if you look where there has been an increase in wastewater indicated by the red dots and correlate that with the, the community, they directly correlate. If you have an increase in wastewater, you're seeing an increase in hospitalizations. So that's really strong evidence that uh, these are very, they correlate very well and the ho increase in hospitalizations is following the increase in wastewater by about uh, one to two weeks. So very, very uh, good and solid data. And if you look at who's being hospitalized, it's mostly the 70 plus year category. Uh, you know, those are the people at risk and over time this is going to seem more and more like flu season stuff where the elderly are going to be the ones mostly at risk. If you look at Houston, we've also seen an increase in our particular wastewater sites. We're at 183 percent of what we reported in, 20, in uh, July of 2020. I'd love to be able to report what the hospitalization date is, but we stopped, we stopped reporting that. So I, I would assume, I, I mean, I don't know, I would assume that most of the hospitals are going to begin to see an increase in hospitalizations for people uh, who have uh, uh, COVID. Now what is the variant driving it? It is now uh, EG5. We just talked about that worldwide. This is the becoming the dominant strain. Uh, it's, the sec it's now 17% of all the cases reported in the U.S. Uh, if you look at XBB 1.16, that's the second leading one at 15%. And so why is that important? <clears throat> well, remember, I've talked about the relatedness. So this is the relatedness tree. And you can see XBB had a, a branch where XBB 1.5 and XBB 1.16 diverged. Uh, and EG5 comes off of that divergent branch of XBB 1.16. So it seems to me, since these are the dominant strains, it's more likely that we ought to be focused on those or a combination of a bivalent to those and another precursor or XBB 1.5 as a, as a strategy. I, I'm not sure picking this particular one that is no longer the dominant strategy, no, no, no longer the dominant variant is the right strategy, but we'll see. I don't think it's been determined, but I sure hope they come up with a bivalent or at least one that targets e, uh, EG5, because that is the worldwide dominant strain. Now this one's a, you know, this paper is from Lily. Lily said, you know, I, I, whatever happened to the dog smelling, uh, looking and screening for COVID? So, you know, it turns out, Amazingly enough, there were actually 29 papers published that looked at the ability of dogs to smell a sample and identify COVID-19. And so these authors looked at the results of all 29 uh, studies, and, and what they showed was dogs were equally good or superior to the RT-PCR test. So if you have a trained dog in your house who's trained to te test for COVID-19, you don't have to do an RT-PCR. Anyway, I'm not sure that's ever going to catch on, but, you know, sometimes you have to just do things because Lily asks. Uh, now, a couple of people asked what's going on with MPOX. Remember last year we had this gigantic outbreak of MPOX. Uh, over uh, 30,000 people uh, were reported with cases, and there were over a million uh, vaccines uh, that were given to really bring this under control. And so MPOX has really been under control, except there's a giant outbreak in China. Not sure why, but the big outbreak in China. Uh, good news is that in the United States, uh, for a lot of reasons, this, you know, it, it's, there's been a few cases, but it really is brought under control. And so good example of where the communication system the CDC used for HIV prevention worked very well for MPOX prevention, the vaccine. This is a wonderful example of how uh, the public health system did work in preventing a spread of uh, MPOX. So uh, probably on everybody's mind, the biggest health problem we face this summer is heat. So, you know, July was the hottest month on record uh, and it it's, uh, surpassed the global temperature record uh, by a, a significant amount. So during the first uh, and third weeks of July, temperatures re exceded the 1.5 degree centigrade threshold that was set in the Pacific uh, in the uh, Paris Accords as a, a sort of a threshold for when things could get really bad. So the whole idea was to keep the te global temperature under 1.5 degrees centigrade because two degrees is a disaster. Well, we exceeded 1.5 twice 
you know, and the other weird thing was the oceans were almost a degree warmer than the previous 30 years, and the North Atlantic almost two degrees warmer. So I like this because it's the best pictorial uh, exa example of what's going on. These are uh, temperature curves for the surface of the, of, the, of the globe dating back to 1940. So the blue is 1940, and all the blues are in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, whites in the 80s, and you can see uh, each subsequent decade, how the global temperature has risen, risen pretty dramatically. And you can see this year has been a pretty, pretty bad. And these are the Julys dating back to 1940. And you can see <laughs> you don't need a graph to know what we're experiencing. I mean, we've had over, you know, 20 days of over 100 degrees that we've never had before. So this is really bad. And then if you look at the daily sea temperature, uh, for all, those of us who are concerned about hurricanes in the hurricane season, the sea temperature has really gone up higher than anyone expected. So we're, <laughs> we're waiting for Mother Nature to have fun with us. But we're, you know, the, the, the big time hurricane season is coming up in September. So hopefully we'll all survive that. Anyway, I want to end this week with a bunch of shout outs. Uh, last week, we did the white coat ceremony for our new students. And this is a big milestone ceremony uh, where the students are coming in from college. I think they're white coat to, to really welcome them into the profession of medicine. Uh, we, this is the first time we actually held this both at our uh, Houston campus but also our Temple students. So very excited about welcoming everyone into the profession. It's a good time to be in medicine. We've got, we've got monkey pox, we've got, we've got COVID, we have global warming, all kinds of things to do. Uh, the second thing is that our, the stamps that we talked about before, our great images, and we've been waiting for them, for finally have arrived. So two of our great images that came out of our imaging center uh, are part of the life magnified uh, stamp set uh, from the U.S. government. So Jason Kirk, who's the director of the Optical Imaging and Vital Microscopy Corps, had these two images. They're really very cool. And uh, <laughs> buy your stamps uh, and send, send, use the life, these life Life magnified, they're very cool. And then finally, of course, it's back to school time. Uh, kids from kindergarten through college are heading uh, back to school. Uh, remember, as you go to school, there's a bunch of shots you need to get. Flu, if you're going to college, don't forget meningitis. Uh, Lily's got all of her supplies, and she's all vaccinated, and she's eager to go back to school and make up for her bad experience at camp. So anyway, everyone have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you. The cafeteria is no longer serving breakfast. See you at lunchtime. Welcome back to school class. I'm Mrs. Smith, your seventh grade teacher. We will learn math and history today. Oh, an apple for me? Thank you, Lily. Thank you.